Well, this morning, we're going to continue in our, in our prayer series. And if you've got the prayer journal, then uh, you know where we're at in, in the lineup. We are on the part of the Lord's Prayer where it says, forgive us our sins or forgive us our debts. And uh, one of the strategies that we had uh, going into this prayer series, because we've been reading through the New Testament together as a church, I wanted to kind of give some Old Testament stories. And so I'm taking the Lord's Prayer and trying to tie the concept uh, with an Old Testament story. Now, I didn't prepare all of the messages beforehand, but uh, just the text and the concept. And the more I study, the more verses start coming to mind. Oh, I wish we should have put that in there. We should have put that in there. So as you're studying, as you're reading through the prayer journal, uh, if God gives you scripture, say, oh, that would fit good in this. Write that down. Take a note of it and journal it. So we're going to be in Jonah, and, and we're going to begin with his prayer that's found in chapter 2. So if you would stand with me for the honor of reading God's word. And we will read Jonah chapter 2. It says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Let's pray. Lord, this morning, as we, as we look at the life of Jonah, and we look at the prayer of forgive us our sins, I pray that you would examine us, God. Lord, if there's someone today that has never placed their faith in you, I I pray that you would call them into salvation. Lord, for those of us who know you, I pray that you would uh, give us the courage to to ask you to search our hearts, see if there's any sin that we're trying to hide and flee from you. And so God, help me to preach plain today so plain a child could understand I I do realize that there is a strict judgment on my life and rightly dividing your word truth and I accept that place for it's in Jesus name that I pray in his name that I preach amen I think you may be seated as we look at the book of Jonah we begin with a call of the Lord to Jonah Jonah is a prophet he's a prophet of God he has made it his life mission to say, Lord, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Whatever you want me to say, I'll say. I'm yours. I'll do what you want me to do. That's the vow he has made as a prophet of God. I'll go and declare and do whatever you call me to do. And so, and so we, we enter this, this book in chapter 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Let's stop right there. Okay. So God comes to Jonah and says, There's a city in Nineveh that I, that I don't like what's going on. They're cruel, they're mean, they're hateful. Uh, they don't worship, they worship pagan deities. Uh, Nineveh was such an evil and wicked city. It's such a brutal city. It is said that they would fillet their enemies. They would cut the lips off of their enemies. They would behead their enemies and put them on a stick and post it outside the gates. They would allow the flesh to rot off the, 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 the heads and become skulls and they would pile up the skulls in big heaps so that when people would come by and visit, before they would enter in, they would be warned. Uh, they are a very brutal uh, city. 
And the word of the Lord that came to Jonah said, the evil has come up against it, and I've seen it, and I want you to go and preach against it. Now, you would think at this moment that Jonah would be like, yes, I don't like that city. They're evil. They're wicked. God says go preach against it. I'm there. And so we we expect Jonah to be like, I'm in. I'm going to do that assignment. But look what happens in verse 3. It says, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. No, we would think that, that Jonah would be like, if you're against it and you don't like what's going on in Nineveh and you want me to preach against it, I'm going. But yet he doesn't. He goes all the way to Tarshish. Now, Nineveh was 500 miles from where he was. So it just gives a long journey. But Tarshish was 2,000 miles from where he was. Jonah couldn't have been more emphatic of saying, God, I'm not doing what you called me to do. Now, why does Jonah have that reaction? Well, it's because Jonah may have known something that maybe maybe you know and maybe you don't know. I'm going to give you a little hermeneutic lesson real quick. You'll make you think you've been in seminary. You ready? Um, It's called a judgment prophecy. And in, in the genre of a judgment prophecy, here's the rule. There is a condition upon the judgment. And Jonah knew this. Since God didn't like what was going on and he was going to cry out against it, It was God saying, I'm going to give you one last chance to repent and turn. And if you do, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive. Jonah knew that. Jonah didn't like that. What Jonah wanted was to God to bring down the fire on him, right? Like, these people are evil. These people are wicked. I'm not going to go to Nineveh and preach so that they can turn? Like, what if they actually turn to the Lord and then God saves them? I don't want them to be saved. I don't want them to have mercy. They need the judgment. Now, let's pause and step back and and let's ask ourselves, do we ever feel that way about any body, anyone, uh, any people? Like, is there a group of people or a nation that we're like, they don't deserve God's grace. I, could, I don't want them to be saved. No, they, they need to be judged by God. They're so wicked and evil that, no, I want the wrath of God to come upon them. I don't want them to be saved. This is kind of where Jonah was. He looked at this group and he said, I don't like them. They don't deserve God's grace. They're not God's people. Uh, they don't know the Lord, they don't, and, and, and they don't deserve your, your, your grace, God. We have got to be extremely careful when we start looking at other people and saying they don't deserve God's grace. Amen? Because guess what? It, it's something you learn when you're little, right? When you've got one finger pointing at somebody else, you've got what? Three fingers pointing back at you. Okay. So if they don't deserve God's grace, guess what? You didn't either. You see, the Bible says that there is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So before I say they don't deserve to be saved, they don't need to hear the gospel, oh, I'm not going to share my faith with them. What if they get saved? No, they need to be judged. Just first remember, it was by God's grace that you've been saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen? And so Jonah's in a bad place. He's in a rebellious place. It says that he went to Tarshish to flee from the presence of the Lord. That word presence of the Lord means that he wanted to leave and get away from the face of God. He he didn't want to seek the face of God. Now, remember last week on the prayer, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. We spoke about the daily bread. We spoke about the bread of presence. And at the tabernacle, that there was the bread of presence to always remember that, God, that God's before them always and that, that we should be praying daily that we to, are to seek the presence of God, to seek the face of God, to walk in the presence of God. He says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our what? Sins or trespasses or debts. Why? Because, mark this down, know this, this is a fact, this is a reality, sin will always cause us to flee from the presence of God. We will always want to hide our face from his face. We will always want to hide. Any of you all have um, kids that's done something they aren't supposed to do, and they all of a sudden get real quiet, and they're like hiding somewhere in the room, pretending they haven't done something bad. Any of y'all experienced uh, a moment when, uh, when something like that's happened and, uh, and they're, they're hiding? Uh, sin will cause us to flee. It will cause us to hide. That's what happened to their, our first parents, Adam and Eve. Remember the story in Genesis that God created this paradise, this Eden, placed them in the paradise. They were in the perfect presence of God, had all the food of the trees that they could. There was just one tree they couldn't eat of. But yet, what did they do? They went and did that one thing that God said not to do. And they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and their eyes became open, and they realized they were naked and they were ashamed. And what did they do? What's it say? Genesis 3, 8. And they heard the Son of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, what did they do? Hid themselves. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hid themselves from the presence of God. They didn't want God to be close to them. They didn't want God to be around them. Why? Because they had rebelled. Sin doesn't want you to be close to God because then they, that, that's when that conviction sets in. Sin will always cause us to flee from the presence of God. When Cain killed his brother Abel because he was jealous and envious, it says this in Genesis 4, 16, Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. The Bible says in Numbers 32, 23, Be sure your sin will find you out. Guess what? You can't outrun your sin. It will surface. Your sin will find you out. But there's something about us that we think, like, well, when we've committed sin against God, we're just gonna we're gonna run, we're gonna hide it, and we're gonna sweep it under the carpet, sweep it under the carpet, keep ignoring it, keep ignoring it, and then one day you're gonna walk in the living room of your home, and there's this big hump in the middle of your <laughs> carpet of all the stuff you're trying to hide. And Jonah, he's he's running, he's he's trying to hide, he's trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. Paul says in Galatians, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that we also will reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from flesh, will reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And so sin causes us to have this deception that we can hide and flee from the presence of God. But let me ask you a question. Can you, can you flee from the presence of God? Can you go to a place where God can't see you, where God doesn't know what's going on, where God doesn't see what you're thinking, what you're, what you're doing? Jeremiah said this in 23, 24, Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord? The psalmist says in 139, Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. He's, he's fleeing from a God that sees everything, that knows everything, that is everywhere present. If you think you can hide your sin from God, you're fooling yourself. 
There's nowhere you can go to. There's nowhere you can run to, to hide. Jonah, he's hiding in a boat. He's asleep on the boat. What's God do? He brings a storm. The storm starts rocking the boat. And the guys that are on there, they start calling out to their gods. Every one of them. They're trying all the gods. And they're saying, help us. Stop the storm. We're going to die. No answer. They go down. They find Jonah. He's asleep. They're like, what are you doing? We're about to die up here. You know, what's going to pray to your God? If maybe your God will hear us and, and, and he'll answer and spare our lives. And Jonah, he knows that the problem is with him. And so Jonah, and now get this, I mean, this is how bad of a place Jonah was at. Instead of confessing his sin right there and making it right with God right there, he says, throw me overboard. He, he would rather die than go to the city of Nineveh and they might be spared. That's how much he disliked Nineveh, the people of Nineveh. And they're like, that. they didn't want to do that. They're like, we can't do that. And so they're trying other things. And, and then as a last resort, they pick Jonah up and they hurl him over the boat. And then the storm ceases. And there goes Jonah. Boop. Down to the bottom. And then God appointed a great fish. We could say it's a whale. We don't know if it's a whale. It's a great fish. It was prepared for him. He gets swallowed by this great fish, which was actually an act of grace on God's part because he would have died in that ocean. So here he is. He gets a moment to get alone with God. <laughs> he thinks he's about to die. He's got the weeds around his neck. He's all this stuff. And what does he do? We read it as we stood. He comes to a realization that God was right and he was wrong. Anybody have those moments? Lord, you're right, I'm wrong. You tried to do it your way and it never worked, never worked, never worked, never worked. Okay, God, I'm going to do it your way. Anybody? I've had those. He says, the vow I made, I'll pay it. Okay, God, I'll do it. I, I, I'm a prophet and I said, whatever you want me to say, I'm going to say. I'm going to declare, be faithful to you. I, have, I wasn't faithful to you, uh, but I will do it. I, I, I said I'll do it, I'll do it. And, and the fish vomits him up, and, and then we get Jonah chapter 3. Aren't you glad that God gives us second chances? How many of y'all thankful for the second chances? Anybody thankful for the third chances? How about for the fourth and the fifth and the sixth? Aren't you glad that the Bible says that he makes his mercy new every morning? Aren't you glad for the, the mercy of God, the grace of God that he provides for us? And so Jonah chapter 3, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it. And the message that I tell you, same thing, same word, same assignment, look at verse 3. So Jonah, what? Rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Okay. So this time he goes. So he goes and he's preaching. Okay. He's preaching. God's going to bring judgment on this nation. You know. You're wicked. Look at what you've done and and, and, and God's going to bring judgment. And the Bible tells us in the story that, that the people hear that and, and they begin to put on sackcloth and ashes. And they begin to fast and pray. They had heard of the God of the Hebrews. They have heard of, of this God parting the Red Sea, wiping out Egyptians, 
the wondrous miracles and the mighty works of God. They have heard of Jehovah. They didn't worship Jehovah, but they have heard of this thing. And the fear of God came upon them as they thought this God is going to bring his judgment on us. And they all began to fast. And then the word gets to the king, and the king's like, is this man saying that his God's going to bring judgment on us? But if we repent, that, that, that God will, will show us mercy. So he calls for a nationwide fast and, and calls the whole nation to pray to Jonah's God, to the true God. They're pagans, right? They're evil, wicked. But yet they hear this message of judgment and they, and they say, we don't want the wrath of God. He says, let's all fast and let's pray and maybe, they didn't even know, they weren't sure, they said maybe that his God won't do what he's saying that he will do. And so they have this nationwide fast, prayer, they repent, and God shows mercy. 120,000 people that receive God's grace and mercy, a whole nation gets saved from the wrath of God. That's called a revival, amen? That's called a woo -hoo. You would think that the story would be that Jonah then says, wow, look at what God's done. I must be an amazing preacher. Look, I saved the whole nation. I mean, I don't know any evangelist today who would go into a nation and the whole nation repents and turns to God, wouldn't put that on their resume, amen? Huh? How many, how many think? That they might get invited to another nation and they might get, you know, they might... Have a circuit. Throw a love offering. I mean, this sounds like good stuff. But that's not what happened. That's not Jonah's reaction. Jonah had got up to the top of the hill, built him a little booth. He's a disgruntled church person. I can just sing. His arms are crossed. His lips out there. He's tapping his toe. He's waiting for the fire to fall. God judge him. God judge him. God judge him. Let the fire fall. Get them. They're wicked. They're evil. Now, think about that. Darkness rejoices in darkness. Light rejoices in light. Death rejoices in death life rejoices in life when people celebrate wickedness and evil and death it's because they're in a dark place Nineveh was in a dark place okay so you can look at it two ways they're so dark and they're so bad and wicked they deserve God's judgment or it's so dark and it's so wicked they need God's light See, I mean, so our nation's in an uproar that life has been chosen and celebrated over death. Why? Well, it's easy for us to, to get mad at a certain group and just say, well, I tell you what, they just, they just need God's judgment and wrath to fall on them, or do, they need, or do people need, need God's love and grace? The light. How many of y'all believe that light always conquers darkness? Light always conquers darkness. And where, there are, where there's death, life needs to penetrate. And so Jonah is up here. He hates the Ninevites. He doesn't think they deserve God's grace. And so he's up there so mad that God showed mercy because they've repented. He built him a little booth. Right? I mean, look, look at what it says. Look at Jonah 4.1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. <laughs> and he was angry. I mean, he was mad. You see, you can hide in many ways. You can hide behind your degree your title, your wealth. You can hide behind even your own Christian shirt. You can hide 
through church membership. You can hide through serving at the church. How many of you all know that you can do the right thing with the wrong motive? Jonah, he did the right thing. He preached what God told him to preach, but his heart wasn't right. He didn't want the people to be saved. He wanted them to be judged. He did. He was obedient outwardly, but inwardly, boy, he had a stubborn heart. How many of y'all know that sometimes you can make the outside look like it's the right thing, but in inwardly, your heart is far from God? And so Jonah, he's all ticked off. He's mad. I mean, he's sitting there. The sun's shining down. He's got him a booth. God, sends, God causes a plant to grow up to give him some shade. So there's a plant that pops up, gives him some shade. He gets a little bit happy about that. Well, at least I've got me some shade. It's hot, got me some shade. And then it says God causes a worm to come and eat the plant, and the plant dies. And he gets ticked about that. He gets so mad that the plant died. That's why some scholars say that Jonah had to be bald because only a bald man would get that upset over a plant dying next to him. And so Jonah's all mad. A plant, why? Because his comfort. He's more worried about his comfort than the lost souls of Nineveh. And he's mad at this plant. God has a little conversation with him. Don't you love it when God gets a little conversation with you? When you're acting contrary to what he has to say and he, he finally just, just asks you some questions. He's like, hey, Jonah, why are you so angry? He says, I knew it. I knew it. That's exactly why, God, I didn't want to go preach to Nineveh because I knew that if I went there and they repented, you're a gracious God and you would show them mercy and I didn't want that. It'd be better to just kill me. Just kill me, God. I mean, he, that's what he's, he says, just let me die. That's how hard his heart was. And then he says, and then this plant, he goes, you, God says, you, you got any reason to be angry at this plant? He goes, yes, I do. I'm mad at this plant. <laughs> now, look, look how Jonah ends. Now, some people, they don't like the way Jonah ends. It's, it ends very oddly, and, and, uh, but I like it because it's open-ended. Leaves us with a question to wrestle with. Look at verse 10. And the Lord said to Jonah, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? It's like, it's like God said, Jonah, Really? Really? You're more worried about a plant than lost souls? You're more caught up in your hatred for these people than my grace and mercy? You would rather I had brought fire and judgment upon them Rather than them repent of their sin and turn to me and I show them grace? Really? A, a plan? You're more worried about your own comfort. Now, I think that's a very important question that we've got to ask ourselves. Is there anything that, that, that we get more focused on than those who are lost around us? Like, do we get upset about things like a plant? Our comfort when something happens that we don't like that affects us? Are, are we more worried about the petty little things that that we don't like, that agitate us, that causes us to kind of be, then the people around us who are, who are dying, are we more concerned 
about viewing ourselves as, oh, no, we're, we're, we're the people of God. God's got to love us and ha- hate everybody else. Or is it that God has sent us to preach the gospel to all people? And that all are sinners and all need redemption and all need a chance to repent. Is there any folks that we look at and we say, I, I hope they don't ever get saved, or I, you know, they don't ever des- they don't deserve God's grace. We heard from our missionary, he's he's going into people groups where it's hostile to even mention the name of Jesus. We could just mark off certain cultures and groups and say, you know what, they're so wicked and evil. Just just let them die and go to hell. Or we say, God, send us missionaries, send us people to go to share the truth of who Jesus is. What about the person in your own life that you just despise? Is, is there anyone that you just disagree with so much? Maybe it's politics, maybe it's religion, maybe it's, I don't know, who knows? In today's culture, you can disagree about anything and get so irate about it that it just just gets out of control. So think about that person. Think about the person that just gets on your nerve and that you just despise. I hope you never have the heart of Jonah and say, I'd rather them go to hell than experience the mercy of God. Maybe God wants you to go speak to that person this week. Or pray for that person this week. Got two assignments for you this week. You ready? Here you go. Write this down, class. You ready? Number one, this week, I'm going to challenge you and myself. Let's get along with God and say, God, is there a sin in my life that I'm trying to hide from you? Maybe Maybe it's an action. Maybe it's an attitude behavior, whatever it might be. Lord, is there anything in my life that's causing me to flee from your presence? Search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. And repent. Father, forgive me of my sin. Okay? So we repent of our sin. Draw close to him. And then second, here we go. This week, my challenge is for myself and you all as well. Would you ask one person, not a church person, not somebody you go to church with, not a fellow believer, would you ask someone that you feel like is not connected to Jesus? Would you would you ask someone this one simple question? How can I pray for you? I was talking with one of the guys that goes to our church, and he was leaving the gym and and uh, there was a guy that, that there was there, and he just he just felt like God wanted him to ask this guy, like, hey, is there any way I can pray for you? So he asked him, say, hey, is there any way I can pray for you? And that opened up a door of conversation. He got to talk to him about the Lord. How many of you all believe that that asking someone about prayer can open the door to a gospel conversation? Anybody believe that? I believe that. Now, is this a hard question? How can I pray for you? It's not hard, is it? How many of y'all think this week you could ask at least one person, hey, how could I pray for you? And then when they tell you, would you pray for them? Huh? What do you think? What would that look like? What would happen if everybody at Living Water Church this week is asking somebody, how can I pray for you? And then engage in a conversation. Pray with them. Join the 16 Weeks of Prayer Facebook group. Share your story. I'd like to hear about it. Because I believe that God wants us to have concern over those who are lost. And yeah, a lot of those people who are lost, they don't maybe act like us, talk like us, think like us. But guess what? By the grace of God, can he save any person by his grace? Yeah. Can he change a heart? Yeah. Can he make people begin to see his truth and his life and walk in his ways he can he's the only one he can amen
So let's go do that this week. What do you say? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. We thank you for Roy, his wife, God, who has faithfully served you for all these years on the mission field. Uh, to, to folks that were maybe hard to the gospel, but they went anyway, to give up being with their kids as they've gotten older. And so, God, we ask blessing upon them, all of our missionaries we ask blessing on, use them. Lord, I pray for Living Water Church, that we would be a people that truly goes out and shares our faith, invites praise with people. That we don't write anyone off, that we would not have a hard heart towards anyone, but that we would desire all people to be saved. Lord, help us to shine the light everywhere we go. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray.